All right, well, thank you all for coming to this talk on street sweeping. I know that, um, you know, as stormwater management goes and BMPs, in some ways it's not, you know, the sexiest, if you will, of the BMPs, but I'm pretty sure you'll all have some good food for thought when we get through the presentation. And uh, just the red one in the middle, or? Uh, oh, wait, okay. Okay, good, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about targeted street sweeping as a water quality BMP. And I'm gonna say this presentation, I wasn't quite sure where the audience was at. I've given a handful of talks on street sweeping and I tend to focus on the research, I or tended to focus on the research in uh, my other talks, but I'm trying to get into some of the applications. So I'm gonna cover a lot and not go quite as deep, but um, again, I think you'll get some good food for thought out of this. And I'd like to acknowledge some of the folks that I worked with at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I did my graduate research in street sweeping and I'm gonna be referring a lot to the study that I worked on uh, while I was doing that. And I certainly couldn't have done it without them. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna cover. Uh, why street sweeping? That takes up actually about half of the presentation. So that's gonna go through key findings of the research that I worked on. Um, most of those findings are pretty intuitive, actually, and, uh, but it's a little better quantified, I think, than what you might be able to do with just a simple thought experiment. And then I've got three examples of some applications that we're working on at my firm. Um, one of them is a targeted re nutrient reduction for a particular lake from, uh, in Browns Creek Watershed District. And then we're working on a street sweeping management plan for the city of Edina which I don't think I've mentioned, but we're out of Oakdale, Minnesota, so this is the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, metropolitan region. And then we have one outstate project. Um, this is in a draft form, but we're working on a nutrient crediting for street sweeping um, for the Lake St. Clair TMDL implementation plan, and that would be for the city of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna hit up the key, find some key findings of this study, quantifying nutrients and solids recovered through targeted intensive street sweeping. Um, like I said, I've presented a handful of times on this study and I'm used to kind of getting into the nitty gritty details. It's hard for me not to do that. And so I might be going over some things kind of fast. Uh, we, I will have time, I'll field as many questions as I can afterwards about this research. Um, if I skip something important, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll clarify as I can as we go. Um, this study was designed to uh, quantify oops, the influence of, I gotta go back, okay, of tree canopy cover and street sweeping frequency on the amount of solids and uh, the nutrients recovered from the street through street sweeping. So we had nine study plots. Um, they were categorized as having a low tree canopy cover, medium or high tree, tree canopy covered, and that was just done initially through visual inspection by the City of Prior Lake uh, Water Resources Engineer. And then later we were able to quantify that using LIDAR data. data. Actually that was done at the University of Vermont Spatial Lab, but we were able to put a, a number, a percent canopy cover over the street on all the uh, sweeping routes that we had. And then within each tree canopy category, we had routes that were swept, I keep hitting the wrong button. <laughs> um, we had routes that were swept uh, once twice or four times, actually that's per four week cycle, so it's um, weekly when you hit the four X per month. Um, if, you're more, if you're interested in this study after I've talked about it, I did provide a web address here in the PowerPoint. Are those gonna be available? Or? Um, that's the home page on my advisor's uh, website for this project. It's got additional reports and um, some other tools that are associated with the project. So. I've got five key findings that I'm gonna present here. And again, they're kind of intuitive, but uh, here we go. So the first one is that yes, indeed, tree canopy cover does influence the amount of solids and nutrients that you can recover from the street. In this case, I'm showing the um, annual recovered phosphorus as pounds per curb mile, and that would be cumulative, versus the tree canopy cover for a particular route. So for example, this dot right here is a route that was swept weekly. It had a very low tree canopy cover, and over the course of a year, we recovered about three pounds of phosphorus for every curb mile. Um, when we get into the higher canopy streets, you know, you can see we're collecting five, six pounds per curb mile. 
Um, and you can kind of see that as you sweep more, you do get more, but you may not um, get as much per sweep, okay? So it took four times as many sweepings to get this five pounds per curb mile um, compared to these, this once per month. They're not the same, kind of hard to compare, but um, you know, the difference isn't four times so on that. Uh, and similar for nitrogen. So we also quantified um, the amount of nitrogen recovered. And I guess I should back up. How did we do that? How did we quantify the amount of solids and nutrients recovered? Uh, we weighed the truck. So the street sweeping study ran for two years. Uh, we had 392 sweeping events total. That's nine routes, a total of 392 sweeping events. The truck would be weighed after every route was completed. Uh, so we knew the weight of the truck, and then we would sample the sweeper ways to get a representative sample of what was collected. And through chemical analysis, we would determine uh, not only the phosphorus and nitrogen content, but also some of the fractions of the sweepings. And the main fractions that we looked at were the vegetative fraction, um, and that would be coarse vegetation, vegetation larger than two millimeters, and then what we just called fines, or <coughs> what you might think of as just a sediment or dirt fraction. So that's where that's coming from. Solids come from weighing the truck and nutrients from the chemical analysis and associated fractionation. Um, okay, so we know that tree canopy influences those things. And then uh, the next big finding, which is also intuitive, is that the recovered loads follow a seasonal pattern. So if you go out in the beginning of the spring, which most cities that have access to street sweeping do, um, there's a pretty good load on the street from all those winter residuals. Um, some of that is decaying vegetation. In this case, I've got phosphorus on my y-axis, and there's still a pretty good load out there. Um, a lot of that is from that decaying residual vegetation, but um, also there's a lot of sediment on the street that's been tracked. If you Sand doesn't usually have a high phosphorus content, but if you sand and uh, have other materials that you apply for non-skid, um, you know, those may also have a phosphorus content. Um, and then it tends to taper off, but notice it doesn't drop off dramatically until you get to like midsummer. Um, and I've got two columns here. One is this higher tree canopy where we have more phosphorus in this case. Um, and the lower tree canopy always is a little less. But it kind of levels off in July and August. And that's when, um, and you wonder maybe why doesn't it drop off, especially in these higher canopy areas. Well, there are other inputs besides leaves, right? There are helicopters, seeds, flowers, pollen. Um, all of that stuff gets on the street and contributes to phosphorus. And um, one thing I didn't include a slide, we did do an informal leaching experiment. And at this time of the year, the um, May, June, uh, early July, when you have those um, plant reproductive parts out on the street, um, there's a higher leaching rate of that material. It leaches more phosphorus. There's, there's less of it so it's not necessarily a super significant source of phosphorus, but, um, but it does leach at a, at a quicker rate. Um, so, and I should mention that if I had just put total solids up here, you'd see a much bigger spike around this part of the country in March and April, because there are a lot of solids in, on the street in the spring, and um, it's definitely worth it to get out and do that cleaning, not only for uh, non-skid, but for water quality. Um, so that's the second big finding. Uh, third one, there's kind of always something on the street, even when they look clean. And so a lot of times you might think that it's not worth it to go out and sweep, but um, regular sweeping does promote water quality. Um, if you look at this, it's just a histogram of all the sweepings, all 392, all routes. And you know, a typical recovered solids load, and this would be dry, so corrected for moisture content is you know, 150, somewhere between 100 and 200 pounds for every curb mile. And there are a few down here in the less than 100, but you know, the tail is on the long, on the high end. So uh, it's not, you know, we don't find one pound per curb, I mean, we, they're never, I guess if you went out right after a rain or right after a sweep, but we didn't sweep every day, um, you might find, that it wasn't worth it to go out, I guess. But there's, there's always something there. Um, and then just to quantify that a little bit more, I looked at um, the July sweeping. So if you remember our seasonal trends, they were low in July. That's when we had the least on the street. So these are the low of the low, and these are the sweepings where we were uh, out there weekly. So there should be less on the street if we're collecting weekly. 
And here's the median values for the dry solids collected, the phosphorus, the nitrogen. And if I convert that from a pounds to curb mile to a, you know, miles for collecting a pound, uh, it takes about 17 miles to collect a pound of phosphorus and four miles to collect a pound of nitrogen. Um, this is in residential area. Mainly our routes were a little bit of light industrial, um, otherwise mainly residential, kind of medium, high residential, um, density residential. Uh, and so, um, you know, it might be lower if we were in a, an area with a, from the last um, talk we saw like a commercial area with a lot of extended impervious surface, large, you know, large contiguous areas. Um, if you convert that to using the recommended operational speed of most street sweepers, that means uh, it takes about uh, an, uh, an hour to collect a quarter pound of phosphorus during that time of the year and you get about a pound of nitrogen per hour. Um, so, you know, this time estimate doesn't include your deadhead time out to the road and back to the dump site and those other um, bits of labor that you have to do in street sweeping, but you know, about a day's worth of work can get you a pound of phosphorus even when it's that time of year that the loading is low. Now, I know there's a lot of questions about, well, does that phosphorus actually make it into our lakes and streams and rivers? And I'll move towards that, but um, I guess hopefully you're kind of getting a feel for this. Uh, the next finding is something I had less to do with in the study. It's um, that the coarse organic material, that vegetative component that's two millimeters and greater, acts as both a source and a sink of nutrients out on the street. So part of our study was a leaf decomposition study. And what you're seeing here are leaf litter bags. So they're mesh bags. They each contain, I think it was 100 grams of leaf tissue. There were four kinds of common street trees that were tested in this part of the study. And uh, they're being pinned. This is what she's doing. She's pinning it with a landscaping pin and some, pin and some fishing line. These were left out on the street uh, for a year with um, one bag collected each week per tree species. So each week they would go out and get a sample and do the chemical analysis to see whether the um, mass of phosphorus and nitrogen had increased, decreased, and they monitored that uh, through rain, through snow. They got snowed on. We had to dig them out with a shovel in the winter. Um, and uh, the results are, um, very simply, that initially, with phosphorus at least, you can get an import of nutrients. So you get microorganisms colonizing this stuff, and the carbon-nitrogen ratios aren't uh, what they need. I'm not a microbiologist, so I'm not going <laughs> to be able to describe that real well. But they will actually take in nutrients from the stormwater, um, and so you have a, they act as a sink for a while. But eventually, over time, they lose the, the samples lose mass. Where does it go? Uh, we suspect mostly it gets washed away. Um, it gets exported either you know, back to other parts of the um, environment or down the drain. Um, and so when you see vegetation collecting, it's kind of an interesting problem. This is a component that we feel isn't that well quantified in terms of the water quality um, and how, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in terms of its contribution to water quality in downstream lakes, ponds, etc. So does this material end up, if it ends up in your water body, um, it can decompose, it can kind of act as a chronic source of nutrients, and it probably isn't getting measured by a stormwater sampler, because this material is going to float past the sampling tube or collect on the bottom, and so it's kind of been a missing component in the water quality picture, if you will. So yes, this clogged catch basin might kind of act as a rain garden for a while. Um, maybe during low flow, this guy is going to take in some nutrients for you. But you can see during high flow, this is not a desirable situation. <laughs> it's going to cause flooding. Um, it's going to cause clogging. And then also, eventually, this stuff is just going to keep moving down, down, uh, downstream towards our waters. Okay, and the last big finding, um, and I'm getting short on time, aren't I? Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Is that uh, street sweeping can be very cost effective? So, in the prior lake study, we tracked costs 
the water resource engineer in the city developed a cost uh, pounds per uh, the cost per curb mile of sweeping. So that and he took into account um, the cost of the sweeper, the labor cost, including some of the time spent by planners and administration, the dump cost. Um, uh, amortization of the vehicle and maintenance, those pieces. You can get a little more information on that in some of the study reports. Um, the, I didn't put this up here, but the median cost of sweeping for this study was $23 per curb mile swept, which is a 2012 cost. So it probably would be higher now. I know that I was working with, uh, in the cities that I've been working with, I've been surveying whether they do their sweeping in-house, whether they contract it. Um, for some of the cities that contract, the cost has been more in the neighborhood of 30 to 35, where we are, dollars per curb mile of sweeping. And that's not usually how they would quote the cost, but if I look at the sweeping that was done and the cost that was paid, you can kind of convert it into a cost per curb mile of sweeping. And that's one side of the street, a curb mile. Um, it's about 30 to 35 dollars per curb mile where we are in the Twin Cities. So when I look at these costs, I want to think maybe like a third again as much would be um, maybe a cost that's more current. So what we found though is uh, there are, I keep hitting that button, <laughs> got to stop doing that. Um, there are some very, you know, some routes are more cost effective than others. If you want to sweep where there are few trees, L means low canopy, four means four times per week. So if you want to sweep where there isn't a lot of overhead vegetation and you go out weekly, it just costs more per pound to pick up the phosphorus. Now, it's up to uh, the individual organization to decide whether 600 pounds per, or dollars per pound of phosphorus is too much. Um, some might say that's cheap compared to a pond, um, but uh, certainly compared to what you can get in these areas of higher tree canopy where you're going out a little less frequently and you're collecting phosphorus for about $100 per pound at certain times of the year, maybe more like $150 per pound, um, that would be pretty cost ineffective to go out you know, in July where there's no trees. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna move on to some of the applications that we've been working on. And the first thing that I'm going to look, oh, I actually I got to back up just a little. So there are, out of this study, so there was the five main findings. There are two products uh, that are kind of the main useful products. The first one, or the first conclusion is that recoverable loads of solids can be reasonably predicted based on simple inputs. So recovered phosphorus or nitrogen or just total solids. And those simple inputs are the timing of sweeping, what month? Uh, the frequency of sweeping, how often are you going to go out? and the canopy cover, which is a little bit harder to get, but you can actually do it either using LIDAR data, or which is a little more expensive and a little more complicated, or through visual inspection and um, making some estimates that way. And what came out of the study is that we developed some regressions that allow us to predict what we expect to be on the street based on some base load plus a factor to correct for the month of the year, a uh, factor correcting for the frequency of sweeping, and a factor correcting for the tree canopy cover. They are linear regressions. It's a log normally, um, it's, it's a log normally distributed regression, um, or log transformed regression. That part isn't, we can talk about that at length if you want outside. Um, but it is a model, it's a mathematical model. So the previous speaker was talking about models not being accurate, but they give you useful information. I can't expect that this would give me, you know, if I want to sweep on July 2nd in a canopy cover area with 20% canopy cover, is this going to tell me what I'm going to get? No, but it's very useful for comparing sweeping scenarios, okay? So I can predict the average that's expected, then I can look at, if I increase my street sweeping effort, how much more do I expect to get? It's a planning tool. It's a good planning tool. Um, then this, and we've developed a spreadsheet calculator tool. This is available through the website that I uh, included on the previous or the earlier slide. Um, it's a beta version. It's a little clunky, but it is um, a useful. I'm just showing the inputs here, but it gives you expected outputs of how much solids per curb mile and nutrients per curb mile that you expect to collect. Um, 
And then the second thing is just that the concentrations in sweeper waste can be reasonably predicted with the same type of simple inputs. And here I'm just giving you an, an example. Um, if you, so this is using our concentrations for street sweeper waste based on the month that it was collected. Um, if I could apply those concentrations to the amount of dry solids collected, I got a prediction. Uh, so I, I knew that I had collected, um, I don't, uh, I guess, oh, phosphorus. Okay, I knew how many pounds of solids I had. I applied the expected concentration and my prediction was this good. If I can supply more information, like do a fractionation in-house or um, just look at the individual fractions, the prediction by taking those expected concentrations and applying them was a little better. These are really good predictions and they probably seem a little too good to be true. And I'll tell you the reason that that is the case is because I've included in these predictions some information about the street sweeping frequency. So uh, I didn't really realize that until I was looking at the slides again today. But if we just use the expected concentrations by month, the predictions are plus or minus about 10% of the actual collected for this study. That's what I got in a calibrate validate exercise. So pretty good. 10% is a pretty good prediction. Um, okay, so those are the two main tools. And here are the applications. So we've got this targeted nutrient reduction um, project in Browns Creek Watershed District. We want to reduce nutrients in Long Lake, which is impaired for phosphorus. And so we wanted to see, well, how much can we reduce the nutrients through street sweeping? Um, Stillwater, Minnesota is a medium-sized city. Uh, it's uh, got a lot of, it's, it's uh, an ex-urban city. It's not right within the larger metro region, but it's about maybe half an hour out. And um, it's got developed sewer and sewer infrastructure. It's not a, it's got an older part of town and a newer part. It's got some capacity for new development where we can put in some fancy BMPs, but some of it's pretty built out. Okay, so in some areas we have limited options for what we can do. Um, and so how do we go about trying to figure out how, what we can do for Long Lake? I'm just gonna lay out the front end strategy here. So here's Browns Creek Watershed District. And I was fortunate they had a P8 model um, that was one of the models that the previous speaker talked about. And so I had already defined drainage areas. Um, this is the whole watershed. But those drainage areas are defined for any uh, given, any given BMP, uh, a stormwater pond, maybe a catch basin. Um, so I had defined drainage areas. And then I looked at where, does, where do those drainage areas intersect with the city of Stillwater, who would be doing the additional street sweeping. And that's this area on the right. Um, and then now that I had the drainage areas, or had the area defined, I could layer on the county streets or the city streets, and now I can get, by drainage area, an estimate of the curb miles that could be swept. So if you think back to I had a model up, I said we need, frequent, we need timing of sweeping, frequency of sweeping, and something about the overhead tree canopy cover. Well, this gives me um, the curb miles that I need to build the estimate, but the timing and the frequency are something I just decide in my estimate, sorry about that. Um, but I still need that tree canopy piece, so how did I get that? Well, in this case, I just did it through visual inspection. So I had examples from Prior Lake that had been Digitize, or that had been um, quantified through LIDAR analysis. And so I had examples that I could compare to and estimate an overhead tree canopy just by looking at the, the photograph. So it's, it is an estimate. Um, and so I could just lasso a group of streets that look very similar, give them an average canopy rating. And then I had this attribute in the um, GIS layer. Uh, so now I can go back and plug that into my regressions. I've got, I've got a street length. I've got, I can decide when I want to street sweep. Um, I can plug in their baseline, which would be a spring and fall sweeping, and then I can compare if I increase the sweeping, how much more will I get? So that's, that's the front end. How do I estimate what I'm gonna get? And so um, I'm gonna move on to another example and, and look a little bit deeper. So, I did the same type of, I'm doing the same type of work in the city of Edina, Minnesota, and that's a little bit larger city. It's an inner ring suburb. 
a lot more built out. They've got you know very developed uh, storm sewer infrastructure, including some aging storm sewers, and some places where they really don't have a lot of options for additional structural BMPs. Um, they have a lot of water, over 30 lakes. Um, so this project, rather than being targeted at a single water body, was meant to um, expand their water resource management plan. Uh, they already have a plan in place for prioritizing their water quality um, goals. And so uh, of the 30 lakes and two main river systems, they've got four impaired waters. Uh, they have to follow some non-degradation policies within each of those river systems. And besides just the maintaining water quality for recreation and um, uh, aquatic life, they have 221 water bodies that receive stormwater, so they also need to maintain their stormwater ponds. Uh, so what do we do? So we used a GAN, they had a P8 model. Um, I could similarly use a SLAM model or anything uh, that had the defined drainage areas, or I could define them myself by inspecting the storm sewer layers. Um, and I defined a direct drainage area for each of the water bodies on their priority list. And by direct drainage area, I simply meant, it's, it was defined this way, um, any streets that drain to a priority water body without being intercepted by another priority water body. So if you look at these pictures, you can see there's a lot of little ponds and things in here. Some of these are in, it's kind of hard to see the purple lines, but they have their own P8 sub-watershed, so their own drainage area within the hydrologic model or the water quality model. Um, and those get accounted for, um, the treatment received there gets accounted for after the fact. But um, but we defined a drainage area based on these priority waters. So I was able to summarize that through a GIS exercise, and now you have, by water body, uh, the curb miles of street that can be swept. If you are looking for funding from the watershed, you can go back into your plan and say, okay, uh, Minnehaha Creek is looking for a three pounds per year reduction in this area to this reach of the creek, so maybe I can get some funding for street, being, street sweeping in a particular part of the city. You know, it, it um, may help you to organize your street sweeping priorities for the sake of procur procuring funding. <laughs> um, so again, so I've got it organized by service level. I did an estimate of the canopy in the same way. Again, we could use LIDAR data. Um, it just is a more time-intensive uh, method. Um, and then by plugging in the timing and the fr expected frequency and the canopy into those regressions, uh, I was able to get an estimate of what we might recover. Oops. So that's, oops, going too far. So for each lake, I've got an estimate for, uh, this is the baseline, this is their spring and fall sweeping. Um, and then I've got an estimate of the reduction to the water body. And how did I get that? Well, it's a very simple conceptual model. We simply applied the efficiencies of the BMPs that were in the water quality model. So if there was a pond that was modeled in P8 or another BMP, a swale, that was modeled as part of their P8 model, we applied that efficiency to the solids that were, would be collected in the particular drainage area. So um, I hope that makes sense. Is, uh, is that the best way to do it? Um, you could build in some more conservative assumptions. You could maybe say, well, I don't expect that all of the solids will make it through to the storm sewer. And if you want to discount that, you could build that into the conceptual model. But in doing that, I was able to get an estimate of what would actually, what the reduction to the water body would be. And it's real unfortunate, I happened to pick a watershed here where they didn't have many BMPs, so the reduction is really small. Um, I kind of took the first ones off the table, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the re expected reduction to the water body is significantly less than what you would collect. Uh, however, that means your BMPs are losing efficiency over time because they're collecting the solids and the nutrients. So um, I'm in comparing the baseline, so I ran a baseline scenario, I ran a bi-weekly scenario, 
And in doing that, I could compare how much more I expected to recover, both from the watershed and to the water body. And then finally, I can get an estimate of the cost effect. I can compare the cost effectiveness of those two sweeping scenarios. If I sweep biweekly, as opposed to just the spring and fall, my total cost increased by about 600% or something. It's sort of 14 sweepings compared to two. Uh, but the pound, the cost per pound of recovered, in this case, phosphorus, um, doesn't increase by that much necessarily. But it does give you, so I know how much I've collected. I know about what my total cost of sweeping will be. And that is based on a $30 per pound of phosphorus, uh, or I'm sorry, $30 per curb mile of sweeping. Um, and then I can get an estimate of the dollars per pound of phosphorus. So you can see that it's very cost effective when you sweep a few times a year. And if you're not doing that, uh, those sweepings, you are collecting a lot of solids and nutrients. And they're well, they're well worth, worth it for many reasons, including safety and uh, appearance. Um, at the biweekly rate, this is still really good. Why? Because Edina, this particular area that I'm showing, happens to have pretty high tree canopy. So they um, are in one of those very cost effective areas. Um, and they're sweeping biweekly. So the cost did increase by as much as 200%, but not that 600% of the total cost. It's still, I would say, pretty cost effective. Um, am I still good? <laughs> OK. Uh, I realize I'm covering a lot here. Uh, the last little thing that I'm going to cover is a nutrient crediting system that's in a draft stage. So I believe there were some talks about nutrient <coughs> credit trading. And how would that work into street sweeping? Um, well, I mentioned earlier that the concentrations, the nutrient concentrations, are reasonably predictable. So if you can keep track of what you collect, you can apply that expected concentration and hopefully get a credit for this. And this has been done in some other parts of the country. There's a pretty good study in Florida where they've done this, and they've kind of done it statewide. Um, what we've got from the Prior Lake study is that if you can regionalize that a little more and take into account the seasonality, you can get a better prediction and hopefully um, more buy-in on the crediting, because it's, it's just a more accurate estimate than using a broad, uh, like statewide, one average per, per sweeper waste. Uh, so what it, just roughly, this is just a draft, roughly what does that look like? Oh, this is in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, which is an outstate area. So we're not in the metro anymore. We're in a population of about 9,000. Um, some of the characteristics of that area, they have about, uh, they have a lot, mostly curb and gutter. And the big thing is they really don't have many structural BMPs in place. The most of the bigger part of the city drains to Lake St. Clair via some ditch systems once the storm sewer daylights. But there aren't a lot of sedimentation ponds or rain gardens or uh, any structural BMPs really. So the main thing that they can do and which they are doing is, is street sweeping. Um, so how would you do that? Um, I'm going to admit this one's a little convoluted. I was trying to take advantage of the um, seasonality and, and of identifying nutrients in the coarse organic fraction versus the fines, but it could be simplified. The main thing is you want to do good record keeping. Uh, you need to know when you swept, sweeper type, hopper capacity. The sweeper type would affect the expected removal efficiency. Um, depending on what kind of equipment you have, you could weigh the truck. If you can't weigh the truck, you would do something similar. You would know the hopper capacity from the manufacturer's information, estimate what percent of the hopper was full. You'd have to do some amount of visual inspection, um, maybe estimate the fractions of coarse organic and of other, of trash, you know, and get each time you sweep, you, you really should get an estimate to take advantage of this information. You really should get an estimate of what's in the sweeper. Was it mostly trash? Was it mostly leaves? You know, how is it broken down? And once you know that, you can estimate the mass, those mass fractions based on either the weight of the truck or you know, if you can do any in-house lab work like drying out a sample, you can get the moisture content. Um, and then you would apply those expected concentrations. Um, in this case, I've just got them broken out kind of seasonally. And I did separate the coarse organics from that dirt sediment-like component because it does have a significantly higher concentration of nutrients. Um, and so you can take advantage of that by tracking that part. 
Um, and then you would just, I didn't fill in the sheet here, but um, I'm trying to discount a bit for the BMPs that they do have in place, which is really just catch basins in this case. Um, and uh, you can just track what we expect to be the reduction to the water body. Um, all that, uh, just really quickly, st best street sweeping opportunities. I said curb and gutter is, uh, it, where curb and gutter do dominates, um, it's, you know, that's a good candidate for street sweeping because things collect there. Does that mean that it's not important where you don't have curb and gutter? Certainly not. Um, but it may be a little less critical. You still need to sweep for, for safety, non-skid appearance, and you do have uh, streets still drain. <laughs> to ditches and other places. Um, if you have few MB BMPs intercepting your stormwater, source control is a good option. Um, few opportunities to put structural BMPs in place. Certainly that's the case in built out areas, uh, dense tree canopy, um, high traffic, other, other types of things. So with that, did I go over? Okay, <laughs> I will take questions. Uh, we have time for just about one question here, and then we need to keep going on schedule. Any questions? Oh, it did so well, I don't have any questions. I don't know. Yeah. The uh, spreadsheets that you have available, yeah. those be up to me? Yeah, um, again, so there was the web address on a slide that takes you to kind of the home page for the project. And I think you have to click on another link, but you can get that or I can send you a version. It is a beta version, it does work, but it's, um, it, it could be fancier. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Right, thank you.